got a Bible, turn with me to Judges chapter 11. While you do that, um, let me just let you know, the next two weeks I'm on vacation, so Pastor Andrew and Pastor Dave will be preaching, uh, and I, I was sorely tempted to actually give them a passage out of Judges, but then I just thought, that's just seemingly cruel. So uh, they're going to preach sort of standalone messages, and then when I get back, we'll uh, start into to Samson's story, who's the last judge. It's actually probably the biggest story in the whole book of Judges, so we'll be there a couple weeks. But today, we want to sort of deal with chapter 11 and a little bit of chapter 12, the story of Jephthah. And uh, in the early service, I kind of ran out of time. So what I'm going to do, to uh, second service, I'm going to change it up. I'm going to tell you his story, and then point to, I think, a couple applications. So that's sort of my goal, uh, and hopefully by the time all said and done, we'll have sorted this story out. It is actually probably, of all the stories of Judges, perhaps the most troubling story there is. And I know that's saying a lot because we've been through some, some interesting territory up to this point, some very puzzling, strange stories. This one actually is considered, and I've heard it referred to as, this is sort of the, the atheist's favorite chapter of Scripture. Because it is so strange and the brokenness of humanity is so much on display and it's hard for us to know exactly what to do with it. Now, that sets the bar pretty high. I've got some tough slogging to get through this, but uh, you can pray for me. I've been praying for you that by the time we get through this, it'll make some sense and we'll know what to do with it. Uh, Now, I've got... I've, I see myself as both advantaged and disadvantaged. So here's the advantage. I grew up in a great era. Like, I'm a product of the 80s. Phenomenal decade, for those of you who wonder. I know some of you are looking at me with great doubt in your eyes. We had things like Expo 86. Uh, I grew up on WWF wrestling back when it was awesome. Many of you don't even know what that is. Many of you know the cheap knockoff version that is a thing today. But, but the beauty of the era I grew up in was that we knew who the bad guys were and who the good guys were. When you turn on the TV Saturday afternoon and reruns of The Lone Ranger came on, there was no doubt. White hats, black hats. Never the two would merge. Now, I will, granted, on WWF, you still knew the good guys and the bad guys. The odd time, one switched teams, but it was like amply evident. Everyone knew what was going on, and the next week, he was on the good guy, bad guy. Today, if you turn on like the TV or watch a movie, particularly these superhero movies, I'm not even sure that I'm all that much a fan of, because I'm confused. I watch them, and I'm trying to sort out most of the time, like, who's the good guy? And because the good guys sometimes are doing bad things, and we see it's like he's sort of good, but he's but he's also kind of like a villain. There's like a darkness to the whole thing, and we're left sort of confused. So I view my era as a golden era to grow up in. But I'm disadvantaged in this regard, because this next generation who has grown up on that kind of storyline, I think actually relates pretty well to what's going on in Judges. Because Judges is not at all black hat, white hat. You follow? There's no clear-cut heroes to this thing. Even the heroes, every everyone other than the very first one where there's like two-verse description, every other sort of hero, I'll use that term sort of loosely, or judges, these people who deliver Israel from the consequence of their sin, they are the most flawed, broken, perplexing characters where we're not sure what box to put them in. Are they good? Are they bad? Like, should we be imitating them or should we be critiquing them? What? How do we, na- and, and even you get to places like Hebrews 11 that, that lists some of these very people in this great list of here's all the people of faith, the fellow we're going to come to today is actually included in that list. And I'm guessing most of us will be hard-pressed to read chapter 11 and say, what's the evidence of this man's faith? We're going to see all sorts of evidence of his brokenness and his sin. I'm the the spoiler, just so you kind of know, I, I think there's one verse one verse that I can find in his whole life that shows me a glimmer of faith and the rest of it is just chaos. So what's the story after all that? In case you don't know the story of Jephthah, maybe some of you know the story of the man who makes a tragic vow. Uh, It's often how he's referred to. The story goes something like this. In chapter 10, so we're kind of scrolling back just to that last chapter, we meet Israel again in this, this cycle, the ongoing pattern of sin, oppression, crying out to God, God sends a judge, which is the name for the deliverers he sends, the judge rescues from the oppressor, and as long as the judge is alive, things go well for Israel, then the judge dies and we repeat, and we've been through this cycle over and over and over again. 
And now we're in chapter 11, and we, we're actually sort of halfway through the next cycle. Israel has sinned in chapter 10. They've worshipped other gods. God has brought about judgment. All these other nations start to oppress them. One in particular, the Ammonites, are going to feature fairly significantly in chapter 11. Israel then cries out to God and says, we re- you know, essentially, we repent. We- we've done something wrong. We've worshipped other gods. And God responds in chapter 10. We were there a couple weeks ago. His response is, I'm out. I've saved you all along. And you keep just going right back to these idols. Go ask the idols to save you this time. And it's a, it, it's a bit of a desperate moment. Now, it doesn't end there. Obviously, the book of Judges has a whole bunch more chapters because we see that even in Israel's sort of a faked, strange repentance, it's not a real repentance. They're playing a game with God. Even in that, he's still gracious enough by verse 16 that he sees their misery and he saves them. And chapter 11 is really the story of how God is going to go about saving them. It's not nearly as, as triumphant or nice and neat as, say, Deborah or from a few chapters ago. Instead, we meet Jephthah, who is, chapter 11, verse 1, a Gileadite, a mighty warrior, but it was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah, and he went out with them. There's his biography. So here's the guy we meet. He's grown up in a place called Gilead. He's got a father called Gilead, which scholars kind of go one of two ways. Either that means his father is probably the most prominent man in this whole place, or he's an anonymous man, and he's just kind of given the name of the tribe. I don't know if it really matters to the story. Um, but his father has had a child, conceived a child with a prostitute, and Jephthah is the child. He grows up alongside a whole bunch of his brothers, half-brothers, who are sort of full family, and they grow up as young men, and eventually the brothers say to Jephthah, you're not getting part of our inheritance. You're not, you're not really part of this family. So why don't you just leave? And he does. And he goes to a land called Tob, which means good, which is sort of an ironic twist, because there's really going to be nothing good about it. He gathers around him, he's even a leader at this point, he gathers around him a group of misfits. Do not think sort of Robin Hood, Band of Merry Men type of misfits. The, the word used is the same word used consistently all through Judges as... as like the word, well, it's translated worthless men in my translation. It's, it's bad. These are not heroes. These are sinful men. Probably what they're doing is they are pillaging and robbing. They are essentially career criminals. It's like Jephthah is like the head of the mob, for lack of a better sort of analogy for us. And he is running this criminal em- enterprise, but he is a leader. He's actually described, you notice the description there early on? He's a mighty warrior. Something about him, despite all the brokenness, people look at him and recognize there is strength and there is leadership. Now, when Israel gets themselves in this situation in chapter 10, and they realize the Ammonites are on our doorstep, they're invading our land, and we've got no one who will step up to lead us, they ask themselves a question. It's in verse 18, right at the end of chapter 10. Here's the question. Who is the men who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? No one wants the job. All through Judges, the thing I hope you're starting to pay really careful attention to is the patterns that emerge. It's, it's like we should sort of have deja vu moments reading through this book where you go, hold on a second. I feel like I've heard that question before. And the reason you may feel like that is because it's actually one of the very first verses of the whole book. If you go back to chapter 1, the first couple of verses, Israel's come into the promised land and they inquire of the Lord. They pray and they say, Lord, who should go up and fight for us against the Canaanites? And the Lord answers. And and back in chapter 1, we see they're actually getting it right. This is how it should be. Those are the kind of questions that if you're a nation, you should go to the Lord about. And by chapter 10, you see the problem. Now they're asking the same question and they're not asking it of God. It's like God is long forgotten. Now they're asking each other and no one quite knows what to do with it. And the way this little scene is actually written is very chaotic. You've got the elders, you've got the captains, you've got the people, and everyone is asking the same sort of things, but no one quite knows who to talk to about this situation. All they know is we need someone to lead us and no one wants the job. And then someone says, hold on a second. Do you remember that guy? Jephthah. We booted him out, but the one thing we know about him, he was a mighty warrior. That sets the stage for chapter 11. So here's what they do. They go to Jephthah, they offer him a job. 
the job is this. We will let you come back, Jephthah, if you will agree to be the military leader of our army. I'm going to put it that way because, again, it's one of those things where you get a whole bunch of particular words working through here with different meanings. So they offer him a job of being the military leader, and he's going to respond, and he doesn't respond in saying, yeah, I'll be the military leader. He responds by essentially saying, yes, I will be the military leader if I also get to be the leader. He's essentially negotiating here. It's actually probably one of his strongest suits through the whole story. It's also what's going to get him in trouble, but he starts negotiating with these people. They eventually strike a deal. The deal is this. He will come back. He will be their leader, but if he's going to do it, when the dust settles and he has victory, he wants it all. There will be no team of leaders. There will be no co-leaders. He will be it. And they agree. They bring him back. Brings us to about verse 11, which is, in my mind, if I'm just kind of imagining or guessing what might come next, I I guess that he comes back, he raises an army, and they go to battle, which is why verse 12 is sort of strange. Instead of raising the army and going to battle, which is what it seems like he's agreed to do, he sends messengers to the Ammonite king. And from verse 12 to 28, they have a series of letters going back and forth as they sort of are kind of doing a quasi-negotiation. Essentially what, what uh, Jephthah is going to do is give the king of the Ammonites a history lesson. And wrapped into his history lesson, he's going to give three reasons why they should leave Gilead and go home. Why there shouldn't be a battle at all. Which again is strange for a man who's recognized as a military leader who has been recruited to lead an army that he would start negotiating like this. The three reasons he gives are, in a nutshell, this. Um, Way, way long ago when we came out of Egypt, we, we came into this land and we didn't really take it. It wasn't that we pushed our way in, but we were fought against. We were sort of pushed into a corner where we had to respond. That's his first reason. Number two is, verse 23, 24, God gave us this land and your God gave you your land. So it's our, ours by divine right. And then the third reason he gives after that is, look, you've had 300 years to kick us out of here. If this was your land, where have you been the last 300 years? And there's his case. Now, the case is sort of a bit strange. It sounds like he's a brilliant historian. And if you just were to read through chapter 11, you would say, this guy seems to really know what he's talking about. He knows all the places and the leaders and the history of all these things, but what is strange about it is most commentators who kind of pick this thing apart realize very quickly he gets all sorts of things wrong. He makes mistakes about the history of Moab and about, he even makes a mistake of the God of, I'll say mistake because I think he's intentionally doing it. He actually says that, that they are worshiping, this is the Ammonites, are worshiping the God Shemosh, which they aren't. They're worshiping Moloch. The Moabites are worshiping Shemosh. What I think he's doing is actually intentionally agitating them. He's insulting them. It's like poking a, a wasp nest. You're stirring up trouble. He knows that by the end, by verse 28, he's not going to have reached a negotiated settlement. He knows he's going to agitate it, the, the Ammonites and enter into a full war. The other thing, though, that he gets wrong is this statement in verse 23 and 24, which reveals a little bit about how much this man knows about God. Here's his, let me just read it to you. This is his explanation of why they should get Gilead. So the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And are you to take possession of them? Will you not possess what Shemosh, your God, gives you to possess? And all that the Lord, our God, has dispossessed before us, we will possess. It sounds pretty reasonable until you read Deuteronomy 2. Which says, in black and white, that's not what happened. God gave Israel their land. God gave the Amorites, Ammonites and the Moabites their land. It's a little brief insight into how little this man actually knows about God. It's going to lead him to a world of trouble in the very next part of his story. It sounds good. It makes it feel like he knows God. It makes it seem like he's qualified to lead a nation. And it gets us into a spot that then leads us to struggle, saying, if he knows God and is leading the nation, is what he does next to the right thing to do? And scholars have wrestled with this, because the very next thing he does is he makes a vow. This is what he's famous for, these next few verses. Here's how the vow goes. He goes before the Lord, and here's his deal. God, if you give us a victory over the Ammonites, I will offer you as a burnt offering. I will sacrifice, kill, and burn to ashes whatever comes out of the door of my house when I get home. 
Now, scholars wrestle with this. They have for the last number of decades in particular. And most of them want to say he did not expect it to be a person. He thought some sort of livestock was going to come out of his house. And so he really can't be faulted for this. Seems a stretch. If you, if, I bet you if you took this and gave this story to a six-year-old and said, here, read this, tell us what you think is happening, there wouldn't be a child alive who would read that and go, oh, I think he expects a cow. Everything about it, every, every part of grammar, every word he chooses, the whole description smacks of the fact that he expects someone to walk at the door and he's going to kill that person and offer them to God. Now, you can imagine why this is so troubling. Because what do we do with this? What do we do with a leader who, verse 29 tells us, has had the Spirit of the Lord come on him, so presumably should know better, who now negotiates with God, and his end of the negotiation is, I am going to offer a human sacrifice to you as an act of my commitment or devotion in in hopes that you will do for me what I'm asking. See why this is so troubling, don't you? If you get into this discussion with someone who doesn't understand this and says, what kind of a God is it that you serve who would accept and approve of this, who would maybe even ask of this? Let me just make sure we all understand what's happening. God forbids this. What we're about to read is the act of an evil man doing an evil thing. What we're actually reading is the story of a leader of Israel who should have been completely different than the leader of the Canaanites, but now has become completely Canaanized. It's a made-up word. I don't think that exists. But you get the idea, right? Israel was supposed to be totally different than the Canaanites. They were supposed to be a light in this world that would draw people to the living God because they were different. Halfway through Judges, there's no difference. The leader of the nation is acting exactly like a Canaanite king down to the very point that he actually thinks that the God of Scripture would respond to the sacrifice of whatever it is that's going to come through his door. The war itself, verse 32, 33, is almost no detail. All we know is he goes to battle, he wins, which leaves us wondering what will come through the door of his house. Really, the whole story now becomes focused on that question. Verse 34, we get our answer. Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came up to meet him. There's her answer. What's he going to sacrifice? to the Lord out of this twisted, broken, sinful sense that somehow this might be right, he's going to sacrifice his daughter. And not just his daughter. There's a bit more detail to it. She was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. He's going to sacrifice his only child. Does that not ring bells to another story in the Old Testament? A man by the name of Abraham who will take his son up to the top of a mountain God will intervene. And so there's a part of us that reads this and goes, oh, I see what God's going to do. Right near the end, he's going to intervene. He's going to like pull a ram out of a thicket and say, Jephthah, stop. Right? There's a part of us that wants that to happen, that somehow would think, well, maybe God will intervene in that way. Maybe Maybe that's how this story gets redeemed because God stops this man from doing this sinful, horrible thing. But there's no ram in a thicket. She makes one request of her dad. Can I have two months? to go away with my friends, to, to mourn. Now here's where some people come up with another theory, because her, her, the language is, could I go and mourn my virginity for two months? And people say, oh, maybe all he does is he doesn't actually sacrifice her. Maybe he gives her like a servant to the temple and she will be a perpetual virgin. And so the, the thing that she's mourning is the fact that she won't have a family of her own and that's kind of a sad thing and so that's what he does the only problem is there's nothing in the language nothing in the story nothing in the wording that would ever the the language is specifically burnt offering language it never gets used in any other way I, I have no doubt in my mind that this man murders and sacrifices his only child now hear me really carefully This is not pleasing to the Lord. If he had known the Lord, remember his problem earlier in the chapter where he starts showing us how little he knows of the Lord? He thinks the Lord did something in Shemosh, almost like they're competing gods, equal gods, each doing their thing in different nations. Had he known the Lord, he would have known that the Lord multiple times forbid his people to ever do this. 
Had he known the Lord, he would have known that if you had dedicated something as an offering and then realized, I don't want to actually burn this animal as an offering, God had made provision where you could give a financial payment in exchange for that animal. 20 shekels, it wasn't that much. He should have known at this point, oh wow, I've made a terrible decision. If he thought an animal was gonna, I thought it was gonna be a sheep, and isn't this weird, it's my daughter came out of my house. So instead, I'm gonna give the Lord a certain amount of money. He could have done that had he known the Lord. Or he could have just done what hopefully any father who loves his daughter would have done, where he said, you know what, I can't, I can't take the life of my only daughter. Instead, I will choose to be cursed by God if that's what it takes. I'm not going to fulfill my vow. I mean, could he not have done that? I, I think he could have. No one was forcing him to do this. In fact, when we read the story, as bizarre as it sounds, when he gets down to this detail, sees his daughter come out, he actually blames his daughter for the misery she's caused him. The man who can't even see past himself. It's just an absolute, utter disaster. We're never really told the details of her death. We're told that for four days every year the women of Israel mourn, they commemorate her life. And then we're told one more scene in chapter 12 that Jephthah actually, after that, goes to war against another tribe in Israel who are upset that they didn't get to be a part of his initial military campaign. They come, they threaten to burn his house down. He gets his army again. He goes and he slaughters 42,000 men who are trying to retreat back home, which actually makes him, in the book of Judges, aside from the Midianite story from a few weeks ago, where Gideon fights the Midianites, and it's a fairly bad story, it makes Jephthah the greatest enemy to Israel in the whole book. He single-handedly kills more Israelites than all the enemies of Israel in the entire book of Judges. And he's their leader. I hope you don't walk away saying, you know, somehow this is a man who's followed after God's own heart or got it right. This is a man who had one brief moment in verse 27 of chapter 11 where he understands that the Lord is the judge and the entire rest of his life he's become so thoroughly Canaanized he doesn't even know who the Lord is. Now what do we do with the story? What's the application? Um, let me try two. Well actually it's one with two subpoints for those who like to keep their notes really. Here it is. Relate to God on his terms, not yours. I think that's, I think that's the big point. I, I mean, there's lots of things we could say about careful with what vows you make, you know, zeal without knowledge. Like People have used this story in all sorts of different directions, but I think the, the driving point is this. Here is a man who decided how he would relate to God. He would negotiate. He would barter with God. He would assume he knew who God was enough that he could just make up the rules of how you would relate and engage with God and then he spent his life relating to God not based on how God wanted to relate to him but on how he wanted to relate to God. And as much as his story is so foreign from us, these are not issues that we're going to face. You're not going to be called to go to battle or tempted to sacrifice a child. I mean, it's just, that part is just so foreign is it really all that foreign for us to wrestle with the idea of how we relate to God? Because I don't think it is. I think we wake up each and every morning struggling with that point. How will I, will I relate to him the way he reveals himself? He reveals himself as a God who is completely good, who loves you. I could ask it this way, what difference would it make in your life if you woke up and you lived every moment of every day confident of the love of God for you? Would you act differently? I think I would. It's when I lose sight of that. It's when I begin to doubt that I begin to act outside of that. But that's the God of Scripture. He can be trusted and say, he says that there is nothing that will take us away from his love. But I think we wrestle with that. And Jesus, I think, refers to some of these very issues. In Matthew 22, he tells a parable. It's, it's a parable about who he is and how he's been received or rejected right before he dies. But it's just, in that parable, I think he, he kind of pokes at something very interesting. It's a story of a wedding. A king's going to have a great wedding. Invites all these people, but they don't end up coming. 
he's not very pleased of it, so he sends out his soldiers and they destroy the original group of wedding guests. So now he's got a wedding, it's all planned, and there's no guests. And so he sends out his servants and says, just grab whoever you can find off the streets. He brings them all in, he provides for them because they've all arrived last minute at this wedding. And as was the custom in Jesus' day, when you were planning a wedding, you didn't just you know prepare the food and the beverages. Stan of Virginia, just so you know, here's how this goes. You actually would provide clothing for all the guests. So I'm pretty excited about how this is going to look in July, right? Of like, what we're going to be wearing. I'm not sure what the color scheme is going to be. But back in Jesus' day, this is how it would have been. So, so the king would have presumably provided clothing for all the guests who would have arrived. But one guest arrived and he does not put on the garments. He essentially decides, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do whatever I want at this wedding. I'm not going to listen to the king. I'll I'll choose what I'll wear to this wedding. And the king, in his grace, in his mercy, actually calls this man friend. He gives him a chance to change his garments. Why aren't you wearing the garments I provided? Like, why why don't you go get changed? And the man won't. He doesn't actually give an answer to why he doesn't. He just doesn't. The story ends this way. So the king has that man taken, booted out to a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, there's lots of probably lessons of that parable, but isn't it at least this, that the king was not looking for the guests of the wedding to choose how they related to him? He was going to set the terms. If you're going to come to this party, here's the garment you will wear. Okay, fast forward to the issue of salvation. We are graciously provided by God the righteousness of Christ to clothe ourselves with. And you know that most of the people in this world have said, no, no, God, we don't want that. We'll just clothe ourselves with, with ourselves. We'll wear our goodness and we'll show up at the party. I think Matthew 22 tells us the outcome of that. We don't get to set the terms of how we relate to God. And yet it's, it's gracious. It's hard for us to kind of wrap our heads of why would someone reject the garments that God has provided? No, it's because we're human and we're broken. And sometimes we're foolish and we all do it. In John chapter 4, one other application of that whole how we relate to God before we come to the communion table. And I'll just deal with this one quickly because I know Andrew will come back to this someday. He wants to teach through a whole bunch of passages on worship and John 4 is kind of the, that's the go-to place. It's Jesus and the woman at the well. It starts off with a conversation about her sin. She quickly changes the topic. I think when she realizes how awkward things are getting to the conversation of worship not realizing things are even going to get more awkward in a second because she brings up the the topic of where should you worship as though somehow the most important question of worship was the location, the, the external things. And Jesus responds to her and essentially says this, that's irrelevant. The where doesn't matter. The how and the who. How you worship and who you worship That's what matters. And he talks to her about the importance of what is inside, the heart of worship. It's like what he does when he talks to the the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, when he talks to them about how important it is, the internal part, not the externals, not not the color of carpets and how comfy the seats are, but where our heart is. And then he talks to her about the who part, the truth part of that. And he sums up the whole conversation with this little statement. That it's about worshiping in spirit and truth. I mentioned that, and I'm sure Andrew will one day talk to us more. I'm looking forward to that day, because he's wrapped his head around some of this way more than I have. I think we can come sometimes in worship and approach God on our terms. Say, Lord, here I am to worship, and I'm going to tell you how I'm going to do it. And lose sight of what Jesus has so plainly said to us. That it's about where our heart's at with the Lord. I mean, chapter 3 of John tells us it's the Holy Spirit that even allows our spirit to to even be able to worship. So I'm not meaning just you. I'm meaning God in you. And then the truth of his word. It's not not up to us to invent what we want to, to believe about God or fill in the gaps with our creativity. It's going to his word and saying, God's told us who he is. Let's worship him for who he is. Let's worship him with hearts that are totally trusting, not getting caught up in the external things because that's how God asks us to approach him. Well, there's much more that could be said about Jephthah, but we won't. 
But if you think of his story for a moment and give him just the slight benefit of the doubt like Hebrews 11 does, we meet a man who is rejected, homeless, who travels around with a group of people that the world looks at and says are worthless. Remind you of anyone? Kind of reminds me of Jesus. He was considered an illegitimate child. He himself said, a son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He recruits a ragtag group of guys that don't really have much qualification, and I think if the world looked at them and said, you're not qualified to do anything. And then, right here, their paths take a wild turn. Jephthah, who will do anything he can to preserve himself and his power, including killing his own daughter, will do nothing to lay down his own life for anyone. He will take lives. And Jesus instead will go to a cross. That's what we remember today as we come to the communion table. So we're going to give you a couple moments to prepare your heart. I'll ask those who are going to hand out the bread and cup if you would join me at the front. And as you do, let me just remind you of just one, one thing because it certainly is a moment of remembering, but it's also a moment of proclaiming. Scripture tells us that when we take the bread and the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You guys can come forward. Don't wait for me. And I say that because every time we come to the communion table, we want to make sure that people, people understand that when we say, if you don't yet know Jesus Christ, please pass the bread and the cup by, it's not because we're looking to put anyone on the spot. It's because we don't want to ever ask of someone that they would proclaim their faith in the gospel if they aren't yet there yet. Of course, we would love today to be the day. But if you know Jesus and are visiting with us, even if it's the first time, please, please celebrate and remember the Lord with us. If not, please just let the bread and cup pass by. We'll give you a moment to prepare your heart.